All right. Good evening, everybody. Really glad to have you join us. We're going to have a special evening, a lot of good information for you guys. And in case um, you don't know who I am, um, I'm Dr. Carpenter, and I'm the founder of New Leaf Health and Wellness in Dallas, Texas. And I am interviewing Dr. Trite tonight, and he has joined us at New Leaf. We're really excited, really excited to have him because he's got many, many years of experience. He's well-versed in a lot of different things. So thyroid issues, autoimmune issues. He's a gene expert. He helps people take what their genes are and know what to do with them. He's worked with a lot of athletes. Um, I can go on and on. So he's just very well-rounded, um, very knowledgeable whether it comes to kind of the, the meta, uh, metabolic pathways or the structural issues. So he can really help with a lot of different things. Glad to have him. And tonight, what I've asked him to talk about is autoimmunity. It's really common these days. Uh, a lot of the people that we work with in New Leaf have an autoimmune condition. And just a lot of people out in the public have an autoimmune condition. They may not know it or not. The way it sort of shows up in the beginning is you just have chronic health problems. You don't feel well. Your energy's not great. Um, your brain may not work the way it used to. Uh, maybe you have some aches and pains. You just feel like you're getting older, and sometimes that's actually signs of some kind of an autoimmune condition. So it really has been affecting more and more people lately. And that's why we wanted to do this tonight and just offer some information. Some of this, if you've been around, may sound like I've, I've, heard, I've heard about leaky gut, but I promise you tonight you're going to be hearing some things you haven't heard before. So stick with us. We've got a lot we're going to throw at you. Have um, a pen and some paper, take notes, and sit tight because we're going to go through a lot of stuff. Um, so basically, if you are someone who already has an autoimmune condition or you're not sure that you think maybe you do, you're definitely in the right place. We're, we're going to be talking to you. Um, so, Dr. Trites, let's start off with some basics. What, what exactly is an autoimmune con condition? Well, the autoimmunity means that your immune system has gone awry. In fact, it is, is attacking yourself. Now, um, there are two typical, two typical types that this attacks. One could be one side, your body's making too many antibodies to yourself. Um, a prime suspect of this would be diabetes type 1 or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Most of us know somebody with one of those conditions. That means their body's making antibodies they go attach to the tissue, and then the second part of that is cellular destruction. The tissue is actually having a, a problem. So in the case of diabetes type 1, the antibodies attach to the pancreas, the body destroys it, and therefore they don't make any more um, insulin, so they have to take it. Most people on this earth have some form of autoimmunity at any given time of the day, but it's kept at bay. Mm -hmm. Until you have a root cause or an infection, exposure to pesticides, toxins, you could have stress of any form, and I can get into that a little bit later. Anemia is another cause, uh, lack of a proper diet, and by proper diet, uh, we would probably have to leave this country to have a proper diet or be informed about it. It's just not uh, uh, written about or in our, in our world. Uh, lack of sleep can get there. Prescriptions can even turn off your immune system and allow something else to happen. Um, some people take supplements that actually allow their autoimmune condition that was being kept at bay by the immune system to no longer be suppressed and it takes off. And then of course, there's also genetics that go in, into play. So there are a lot of things that can actually turn on an autoimmune condition. You just listed a whole lot of them. And I heard you say a couple that people may not know about that even a supplement, maybe think of supplements are natural, they're good for you. Um, there's no harm in taking them, but you just said that for some people, a supplement, the wrong supplement for them, could actually let an autoimmune condition kind of grow or, or start. Correct. So you have to be pretty careful. Isn't that a stinker? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in our world, we're able to work with people and kind of guide them on what's safe. Correct. So, and I'll just tell everybody, you know, we're really careful. We don't just give you a whole bunch of supplements and just say good luck. We're very careful about what you get. And that's one of the reasons. Now, we talked about a lot of things that can create an autoimmune condition. Um, can it actually be cured? Can it be reversed? 
Well, in the uh, alternative medicine world, there's nothing that we can cure or reverse. It's just a legal statement. And there's no research that I know that is aware that anybody can be cured. Yeah. That said, when you treat the root cause, reduce the inflammation, and you have proof of reduced antibodies, proof of an, a decrease in cellular destruction, or the tissue actually has been corrected, another medical test, such as uh, other lab tests, as well as your symptoms, that can show that the reversal is now eliminated, uh, we call that managed. So you can manage it to the point that there's no longer any other conditions. It's just the same as somebody had a heart attack. Do they have cardiovascular disease? Possibly, maybe. But if they do all the stuff to reverse it and it goes away and they no longer are taking any prescription drugs, they no longer have any symptoms, they no longer have anything there, they'll still be labeled with cardiovascular disease, but they're getting along pretty good. Yeah. You know, and we hear people come in who've been sort of in the medical world and they're either told, oh, it doesn't matter. I hear that a lot about Hashimoto's. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just take a Synthroid and you're going to be fine. And that's not true because the destruction is still going on. Meanwhile, your prescription may need to go up and up and up because it's getting destroyed. Or they might be offered a really strong prescription that just shuts down their immune system to sort of try to stop the destruction. And meanwhile, the destruction is still going on and on. Um, so what you're saying basically is if you really identify what the root causes are for each individual, then you can work on managing what those root causes are and then they actually function in a healthy way or pretty close. Like they're going to live a much happier life. Oh, absolutely. You're, you're just talking about eliminating the stressor. I mean, uh, most people think that stress is, you know, uh, the last argument I had with a, a friend or something, but you know, it could be the food that you had. Yeah. Uh, you might have an infection. Uh, there are uh, hidden toxins in a house. I mean, let alone uh, whether it's mold or the air. Uh, yeah. Some people just have hormones that are imbalanced and it's no fault of their own, but it could even be their drinking water that did it. And uh, all those create a physiological stress, which drive this autoimmune condition. Yeah. Well, one thing that if you read about autoimmune conditions, you're going to hear a lot and even just kind of sample all your friends, like who, who has autoimmune conditions and who doesn't. It really seems to have an effect on women more than men. So why is that? Well, it's unfortunate, uh, but uh, women go through a different phase. Uh, well, I'll just, I'll stay, I'll be nice. You're smarter than us. You grow faster than us. And initially your brain goes in a different direction. You mature earlier than us, mm -hmm. but uh, about the time you go through your first menses, your hormones go way up as well as what, what do most women eat? or young women eat between the ages of, let's say, 10 and 15, whatever they get their hands on. Yeah. So, you know, 200 years ago, it wasn't uh, a possibility of a candy bar or chips or soda or anything like that. But today, that is a reality. That is what happens. And that's really still what's in most of the schools where the kids just actually take it because it's easier. Yeah. So you create a blood sugar handling problem. Mm -hmm. or whether it's too high a blood sugar or worse, most people don't eat breakfast and a protein for breakfast. It's yeah. too low in the morning. Yeah, Plus the imbalance of hormones. It is your cocktail soup for autoimmunity because the body's immune system is run by proper blood sugar handling. Yeah. And without that, we get that cortisol stress hormone and we can go on in detail about that, but that's really your setup. Yeah. So definitely want to come back to cortisol in a second, but while we're still talking about kind of the difference between men and women, so I'm hearing you that, just women's hormones and how changes start to happen in puberty kind of set them up to be more susceptible. But I've also heard you talk about men and having low testosterone and how that can set men up for autoimmune conditions too. So talk a little bit about that. Well, um, your typical, this would be a, a standard low T individual for lack of a better explanation. I call them toads and really that's what they are. They sit around uh, they have usually a, a, a large belly. They cross their arms. And when anybody asks them to do something, hey, would you like to go out to a movie tonight? I don't care. What would you like to eat? I don't care. Uh, if we do go out to a movie, what would you like to see? I don't care. They have no drive, whether it's personal, sexual, lifestyle. There's nothing there. But where did it start? It started because their blood sugar was usually off. And in this case, generally pushing toward a, a type 2 diabetic or they have a high what's called an A1C. Mm -hmm. And give that enough time, it starts to turn off their thyroid. 
And when their thyroid is underperforming, which is kind of the master endocrine gland, it doesn't run everything because it does come from the brain, they stop getting the signals to make the proper amount of testosterone. Then the body is now stressed. When you have stress, it creates cortisol, which binds to the testosterone they already have. It sets them up for a leaky gut. If they have a leaky gut, they could have that crazy thing called gluten that comes in. Yeah. And now you have a liver problem, a gut problem, a brain problem, a thyroid problem, as well as a blood sugar problem. And it's only a matter of time because now they have their soup to create their, their problem. And the, the problem with a low T center, if somebody really has a low T, they better have a proper working thyroid, they better have a proper working, working blood sugar, the gut better be okay and the liver okay. Then they qualify for um, testosterone pellets or injections or even a uh, topical. If yeah. you don't have those working, then the side effect, because the body can't process it right, are all the things that happen when you give a thyroid supplement or take an injection. It's the same problems that happen if you're uh, using uh, steroids because technically testosterone isn't based off a of steroid. They get those side effects, which they're not very safe and they're not, it's, it's just not very, uh, but the efficacy on them is pretty, pretty low. Yeah. So I know a lot of guys are reluctant to go into the doctor anyway, but if they're having these issues and they know the testosterone is low, they're just likely to probably go get some testosterone, get a prescription yeah. of testosterone. But what you're actually saying is there's a lot of stuff they aren't aware of that's, that got them to this point. And if they don't fix that, they're going to wind up even worse if they just do testosterone. Yeah, and I encourage everybody to go look up the studies with the uh, exogenous testosterone, whether even it's the pellets and the, the increased risk of heart disease or, or even heart attack. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. But if they will work on their thyroid and their blood sugar and maybe their gut health, then at that point, they would be a good candidate for doing testosterone. Right. Even need right. I'm not against it. I just want it to be done right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So basically, you're saying for women, all this hormone soup stuff starts earlier, and they're more likely to become autoimmune when they're having some dysregulation with blood sugar and hormones. But for men, it seems like it's happening later, but it's still sort of the same punchline. Blood sugar gets dysregulated, then the hormones get off and then they're kind of a candidate for developing an autoimmune condition. Correct. Okay. All right. Now, we talked about root causes earlier of, you know, why would you begin an autoimmune condition to begin with? And in our office, we talk a lot about two of the root causes because they seem to be probably the most common and we kind of pick them off first. We talk about hidden infections. We talk about food sensitivities. So, some people, you can read articles online about, you know, this gluten thing is just, just a fad. What do you think about that? Well, I'd like to tell you it's a fad, but it's not. So let's, let's just go backwards into the history of time here, how this gluten thing came about. So here, here are some real good numbers for you. In 1850, they figured out how to do the extraction process to commercialize grain. This is 1850. In 1855, the first gluten intolerance was noted. Now, uh, doing some research, they found that not only was gluten intolerance or celiac disease found, it was first noted by Hippocrates that uh, upon a, an examination of the bones of, of uh, an individual that had passed away, they realized that there was not only a, uh, there was a grain issue that they were having that was destroying their bones. And uh, then the next thing was they found that, uh, and we're, you know, we're talking a couple thousand years ago here. Yeah. Uh, milk was a very big sensitivity at the time. So let's mm -hmm. fast forward back to 1892. Um, a man by the name of Ford figured out how to make whole wheat cereal. Mm -hmm. In 1894, a Dr. Kellogg, he was a GI specialist, and uh, he noticed that most of his patients were constipated. They were eating too much meat. So to alleviate constipation, he knew that a grain that had gluten in it would help with the constipation, therefore uh, allow them to have a little bit of diarrhea and they would actually feel better. Uh, why does it do this? Is because gluten irritates the bowel. It did this over time as a genetic change. It's its mutation to make sure that if an animal ate it, it would irritate the bowel and then be planted somewhere else so that it could live on. 1897, grape notes is invented by Dr. Post. You guys might follow these, you know, Post cereal, mm -hmm. Kellogg's cereal. Yeah. They went on to do some stuff with that. So gluten 
is uh, is not is, is part of our human history, but it's it's man derived. When we changed the process, meaning we made something that was whole and we made it commercialized, it changed. So they have a seed that's protected and it still is a gastro irritant. But when you open it up, now all these toxins are available and they make the irritant wor worse. Mm -hmm. So in 1922, so many of these doctors, this is the medical society, were saying, we have got to do something about the grain. These people are coming in and we're treating something called beriberi. Yeah. That's a good Dr. Google search for you. In 1931, Dr. Dickey came along. He was a pediatrician. That's where celiac was first mm -hmm. diagnosed. They came up with the term celiac. In 1932, Dr. Crohn, you might have heard of Crohn's disease. Yeah. In 1940, the chemical fertilizers were put in to increase the yield, but they decreased the nutrients. Unfortunately, that left more gluten. So people still had the inflamed bowel problems. They still had um, high fructose corn syrup was uh, first brought in too. Other subsidies, uh, they knew that they were starting to be depression in the people, berry berry still going on. And so um, Cargill and Monsanto started buying up all these little farms as opposed to depression. And in 1943, the U.S. government said, okay, that's enough we're not going to allow you to kill our Americans. So we're going to add B1 and B3 for fortification on the grains or you can't sell it. So that's the history there. Okay. And that's why we can't export most of our grains to most of the countries because it has been commercialized so that, but they're really good at marketing. It has you, we will sell you this product that we can't, you can't eat, but we fortified it as part of your nutritious breakfast. But look at the history of the world. We didn't eat grains for breakfast. It's a marketing uh, it's brilliance in marketing. Marketing. So, I mean, they're they're so smart about knowing even where the animal will look back at the person or the character, uh, because it's a psychological. It's actually nine point five percent is the angle for the cartoon. So, um, if you don't go with a grain or a necessarily a wheat, you put corn in it. But there's nothing in corn that has has any essential amino acids to support life. So. Uh, again, we'll go a little bit further. In 1953, the mucosal lining has been, was known to destroy the grain. So this is 1953 science. That is the testing. There's three antibodies there for celiac testing. Mm -hmm. That's it. There are 153 antibodies at this time that we know of. So if somebody comes back and says, hey, I, I was tested. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with gluten. The gluten didn't test for me, or I don't have celiac test. Well, you're negative on three tests, but what about the other 150? Right. And here's the thing. The what's called sensitivity and specificity are two different things. And these are not very sensitive and they're not very specific, especially if it's one out of or three out of 153. Yeah. So that's why we look at a bigger panel. We want to look at, at different things, but it's not necessarily a fad because it's been there for so long and then it has so much science behind it. But if we suppress what is the reality of what's there, yeah, it's a fad, but no, it's not. I don't know if you can call a fad something that's been around for 150 years and that, uh, that we can even link some of the things because when I was a kid, Alzheimer's wasn't even an issue, but now it's a big deal, but you can link some of the changes in Alzheimer's because it creates a, what's called type three diabetes, which is a blood sugar problem from the gastro irritant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it leads back to um, Alzheimer's uh, autoimmunity with the grain can also be precancerous and every ten, uh, one in every 10 celiac pans, patients ends up with cancer. So there's a, there's a correlation between the two. So, uh, I yeah. kind of throw fat out. If some I get on my little soapbox if I if you haven't noticed. <laughs> well, it's quite a history, and I feel like you know most of us have probably just kind of heard online, and we just sort of notice people that it seems like this whole gluten thing came out of nowhere and has been recent. But from the history you just shared, I mean, it's like 1855 was the first documented case, and you mentioned something about kind of um, looking at bone destruction. And I know in school, one of the things that I was taught is if someone has osteoporosis, you automatically must screen them for gluten sensitivity. Yep. And I don't know how many doctors actually do that, but well, I was taught that in school. So I checked, well, people, you know. I wasn't taught that in school, so good for you guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, glad you were. Yeah, I'm glad we were too. Um, we were talking about root causes and there are three main things that I want to make sure we get to talk about tonight. And two of them, I think most people probably have heard of, they may not know a lot about it, but one of them, I don't know if they make the connection between this and autoimmunity. So I want to have you, and we'll go through them one by one, but I want to have to talk about cortisol and the adrenals and stress. And then let's talk about the gut 
um, leaky gut, gut health, and then let's talk about the brain. So some really fascinating stuff about the brain involved with autoimmunity. So let's start with cortisol. Um, for people who don't know, our adrenal glands produce this hormone called cortisol that kind of helps us go out and do things. It gives us a little energy, helps regulate blood sugar, uh, just helps us deal with stress. And when people get really tired and run down, they'll hear, oh, you have adrenal fatigue. So adrenals often get the blame when we don't feel great, we don't quite know what's going on. Um, so Dr. Trites, tell us a little bit about this scenario. Yeah. So as Dr. Carpenter stated, cortisol is a stress hormone. And uh, the, the common notion in so many different avenues is you have adrenal fatigue. But why in the world would you have adrenal fatigue? I'm not against the term. I'm against the mechanism of it the, uh, or the treatment of it. Because why are your adrenals so tired? What is going on that would make them so tired? It's just that your adrenals are tired? No. There's something else going on, whether it's uh, one of those hidden causes that we just uh, recently talked about for um, autoimmunity, but yeah. you don't have to have autoimmunity. I mean, you, you could have cardiovascular disease or you could just have a, you know, a lousy relationship or a lousy job that just continues to run this. But the longer the cortisol stays higher in the body, the longer you have the opportunity to suppress an immune system. So you have a person that, you know, I get sick all the time or every single change of the season, which is a stress. Um, I get sick or my allergies come up. Okay, we need to monitor that cholesterol, or I'm sorry, the, the cortisol. And then, uh, so here's a, here's a typical case. We're sitting in, a, in an office, uh, another doctor and I were talking and I said, okay, so here's my typical cortisol case. Uh, we'll just say a 43-year-old woman, she might've had anemia in the past, she may be autoimmune now, but at some point in her life, she had high norepinephrine, epinephrine, that's adrenaline. And then they're onto the cortisol world. I mean, they may or may not have a blood sugar handling problems, but most of the times they do. Mm -hmm. um, and they just started telling me about brain fog and memory disorders. And then the other thing they say is, you know what? I work out every day. I do what I'm supposed to. I eat what I'm supposed to. And I just can't seem to lose the extra 15 pounds. Yeah. How so, often do you hear that? Yeah. What, what should a woman do? So what do they do? They might start with a nutritionist or get online. And so they start counting calories. Didn't work. And okay. Water. Well. Uh, let's work with a physical uh, educator. I might go get a, a go to a gym and work out with a, just a trainer. Tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do. And a trainer will say, work out more. You're not working out enough. Doesn't work. Okay. I need to go to um, an endocrinologist because maybe I have something wrong with one of my thyroids or my estrogen progesterone is off. An endocrinologist will give you something for your thyroid. We talked about Synthroid mm -hmm. um, and that may not be the best option for you. Or they may give you estrogen progesterone, which is much the same as those men who are going through endopause with a low T. Um, mm -hmm. So they may feel better for a little bit. There's usually a nice two to four week bump before they're back to where they were. Right. Well, maybe there's something going on with me. So let's go ahead and get to an immunologist and, and maybe they can check to see if I have an infection. Maybe, maybe not. But I mean, an immunologist might end up getting an, uh, an antibiotic and then we're back to more cortisol. Yeah. And so uh, if, if you get really desperate, I'm going to go to a surgeon and we're going to do some liposuction. So the question is, who's right? Mm -hmm. um, what is it? Uh, it could be a lot of things if, if, you, if you heard what I was saying. So the big deal with cortisol is it slows down your memory. It destroys the learning and the memory center and it also changes the circadian of sleep. So if you're not sleeping well, this is going to be a cortisol reaction. Uh, it also affects blood sugar it also leads to this thing that we keep bringing up again and again called Alzheimer's. So we want to keep the cortisol at bay. So if there's any type of allergy, uh, joint pain or an inflammation to the pain, it could be autoimmune. It could be just, you know, uh, you're kind of rough on your body or you do things you maybe shouldn't, you know, better. Uh, you could have inflammation, whether it's autoimmune or not. You can have foods again and supplements that continue to cause the body to be stressed and get there. So often the adrenals are to blame and it's not the, it's not the adrenals itself. It's, and that's the same with the ovaries and the testes. They're yeah. often blamed for hormone imbalances when it's not their fault. Yeah. They are ready to do their job, but they're just not getting the signals. Right. So if we so, go ahead. <laughs> if, if the adrenals are not at fault, would you test cortisol? Why, why would you test the adrenals? Well, I want to know what's, what kind of function do we have left? Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, uh, at some point, 
for an individual, I need to get them moving, but let's say their oxygen content is way too low for them to even go for a five minute walk. Mm -hmm. um, I need to have a baseline before we get there. If, if you can't do a five minute walk, I need to start with a one minute walk. So we need to know the baseline and what your adrenals are doing. If uh, your adrenals are not putting out the right amount of, well, we could look at norepinephrine, epinephrine, but we could also look at the main one we wanna look at is cortisol. So if it has impaired uh, motion or, there's this way that comes up. It's supposed to be very, very high in the morning and then it kind of goes down throughout the day. Why? Because as this comes down, melatonin's coming up. So when you get to here, you're ready to go to sleep. If your cortisol, for whatever reason, stays up high or is at a certain way that it suppresses and the melatonin can't necessarily break through, you don't sleep. And we know that there's some big problems that happen there. How can you repair and get better? If it stays high here, it also destroys the lining of your gut. So we are gonna talk about leaky gut here in a minute. And if right. you don't have the cortisol down, how in the world can your leaky gut ever repair? It can't. Yeah. Because that's your problem. It's not adrenal fatigue, it's your cortisol. Yeah. So if your cortisol is high, it's gonna affect your sleep, it's going to affect your memory, it's gonna affect your gut health, it's also gonna make you gain weight. And that's probably the first piece that gets a lot of people in to get help is I have this weight I just can't lose no matter how much I exercise or how well I eat. So if you test the cortisol, then you kind of know where each person is and then how to work with them from there. We do, because I don't know what your job is. I don't know what your relationships are. I don't know what your finances are. I don't know what your food is. I can ask you for most of those, but uh, the research is is solid on the vast majority of adrenal function, which has to do with cortisol, is brain-based. It's not physical, it's brain-based. Things that are happening to you and how you perceive them. Yeah. Well, I wanna talk about brain more in a second, but first let's touch on leaky gut. And we talked about the cortisol connection with leaky gut and there's an autoimmune connection with leaky gut. So just step back for a second and for people who maybe don't know just what is leaky gut all right so uh leaky gut sounds kind of gross <laughs> it does. yeah it, it does but uh if you must look it up if you're a researcher uh, it's uh, intestinal permeability so um hope this can make sense inside of your bowels you have this lining that kind of sits here like this and they're nice and tight. And as the food comes down, it gets digested and it gets into these tight little gaps here and it goes down and the body absorbs it. That's normal. But when you have those things that can create autoimmunity or infection or antibiotics or hormone imbalances or you're taking hormones or other prescriptions that do that, or you decide you're just gonna spray Roundup Ready every day long, all day long, we know that that creates an Expression that makes these holes bigger. When you get big holes like that, now the foods that you eat will, instead of being completely digested to get through here, now they can go through as particles. This is your great setup for uh, allergies. Mm -hmm. Not to mention this gluten molecule that's about that big can now go through that hole and get into your bloodstream. So we are now running a test on most patients for gluten sensitivity or gluten antibodies within your bloodstream. We know you're not injecting them in there, but it's a, we'll call it a backdoor way instead of a biopsy of your gut to see if you have gluten in your bloodstream, you have a leaky gut. There's no way, I guess you can inject it, but I've yet to have anybody walk in my office and do that. Yeah. So the reason we want to know that is because most people walk in and say, you know what, my memory is starting to shut down. And I will be the first to tell you, if you're saying that, the what's called neurodegeneration has begun and i'm going to get to that in a little bit yeah. later yeah but when you swell and there's a bloating if the junctions were tight they've now pulled apart mm -hmm. so we use a couple products in our office to help keep that junction the best it can and if, it, if there is some swelling processes before we get the inflammatory processes down that it doesn't swell as much we can still get some sort of integrity back um, this is important because there are 400 times more signals that go from the gut to the brain than the brain to the rest of the body. 
Um, 20 years ago, psychiatrists just gave an antipsychotic, whether it's antidepressant, anti-anxiety, you take a pill and it goes down to your gut. Now, let's use some common sense here. How did that little pill get broken down in your intestines, put into something, and got up to your brain? Well, they would, most people say, well, the same way you would eat food and it would get up there. Yes. Yeah. But there's this thing called the blood-brain barrier, which is very close to the gut bar barrier. And if you have a tight brain barrier and it only allows sugar and certain proteins and special things that the brain needs to have, how is that pill going to get in there? It doesn't. But how it does work is that pill gets into the intestines. The nervous system called the enteric nervous system recognizes what that is. That molecule sends a signal up to the brain and says, oh, we're making that molecule today. That's how it works. So in my last, uh, from brain to baby, from baby to baby boomer uh, neurological conference, half of the people in there were psychiatrists. Wow because they're wanting to know how to fix this leaky gut because they understand that's their livelihood. Yes. 400 times going this way, then one going that way. So it's important. Yeah. Uh, if, if a kid has an infection, that's a strep, well, well actually a strep infection that gets into the gut, that is, and they have what's called a genetic precursor for what's called dopamine one and two receptors. That's your precursor to OCD. Uh, leaky gut causes muscle damage. So people that have had uh, conditions, whether it's autoimmune or not, and, or they uh, floxed might be another thing. If it gets through the gut, it can allow certain proteins within that uh, immune system to go attack their muscles. So we don't want a leaky gut. We want the gut to be as in, integrated and tight as it can because when the gut goes, the brain goes, period. If you have a head trauma, the brain goes, and now the gut goes. They're buddies. So along with this connection that you're describing between the gut and the brain, what if someone's having anxiety or depression? Well, that's a pretty good question. Uh, if you're having anxiety and depression, we really want to look to see what's going on within your uh, digestive system to begin with. Do you have an infection? Uh, do you have an autoimmune condition that's allowing this? First, what are you eating? Uh, because you might be eating foods that raise or lower your blood sugar in such a way because your brain needs really three things to survive. It needs the right amount of blood sugar. It needs the right amount of oxygen. And it needs the right amount of stimulation without, you know, uh, from the gut to tell it this is what we're doing today. So there's, um, it needs a fuel source. So it could be a, a fat, a, a good fat. Well, what if you're just eating uh, fried foods? brain doesn't have anything to work with so it has to have some some benefit to get there and has to have its building blocks or it's going to be in trouble okay so while we're kind of already on this topic with the brain i want to go a little further um one of the things that i see it's probably i want to say it's the second most common complaint people come into the office to see us about is brain fog What's your concern when people say they're having brain fog or their memory's not as good as it used to be? Well, what we know now with the brain is brain fog is the first sign of neurodegeneration. That means your brain or your nervous system is degener degenerating. It's a first stop. So there might be seven signs of Alzheimer's and six signs of Parkinson's and five signs of dementia. Brain fog is the first one for all of them. All those fall into neurodegeneration. So do we want that? No. no that's a real concern. That's a real Big concern. concern. So... Uh, there's really no difference. I mean, we're looking at brain fog, for instance, but let's say somebody has a concussion versus somebody who has celiac disease versus somebody who has leaky gut or an autoimmunity. We can stop right there. It all looks the same on an MRI. So when a football player goes and has these major concussions and they do biopsies of the gut, they look just like celiac or autoimmune uh, gastrointestinal disorders. Yeah. The same thing as somebody who has celiac or autoimmune leaky gut, and they do autopsies, and they look at the gut, and then they do MRIs of the brain. They look just like they played football. Mm -hmm. So when you have a swelling or in the gut, or you have brain fog, which might be related the same way, we got to look at the whole picture here. So uh, we look at, at brain fog as, you know, we're, we're actually behind the ball here. We have got to get ahead of this 
and get in front of because it what drives early neurodegeneration it's altered fuel so you don't have the right amount of oxygen you don't have the right amount of glucose or ketones you don't have the right amount of uh, essential fatty acids your body's not you may be taking them your body just may not be absorbing them that may be part of the leaky gut and then this other thing that we look at in all your genetics is methylation if you have the proper amount of methylation you can't get there so we got to look at all those so act, you could have altered activation your hormones or growth factors or things that cause inflammation and there might be a new stimulant so once this starts to go with brain fog most people reach for something that might be uh, sugary or caffeinated, and often those have these other excitatories called monosodium glutamate or a form of glutamate or aspartame. And then that lights up the brain even more, causing more brain fog and can also cause more bloating and some other things that go with it. So I wanna go back to something you said a second ago, so it was really important. I wanna make sure people heard this. Um, you mentioned concussions, that concussions look like celiac disease on an MRI, the way it affects yeah. your body is as serious and you know we're hearing a lot more about concussions in the media these days in relationship to sports and you know young kids and athletes who are having any kind of head trauma um that's a big deal and i know personally that having a concussion can make you more likely to develop an autoimmune condition and i know one person who had a head trauma out walking the dog and a month or two later, started having signs of Hashimoto's and tested for Hashimoto's. So, you know, she didn't have to be an athlete. She wasn't a kid playing soccer or anything. And just this head trauma is what kind of instigated Hashimoto's for her. And so I think that's something that isn't talked about much yet. I think it will become more so, but I'm glad to hear you bring that up tonight. I just want everyone to hear that, that concussions are important. We need to pay attention. And if you have one, you need to be under medical care. You need to get checked and do some things to prevent you from getting worse from, from that after the concussion. Uh, that, that goes with uh, any type of motor vehicle accident. Anything over five miles an hour, you bump something. There's enough of a, a trauma there that, that can create that. I don't want to say that everything's going to cause every, everything. That, that's not the case. But yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Concussion, I highly encourage you to do it. You have a fluid thing that's sitting in here. It's not attached to anything. So any motion going forward, I mean, um, you know, I've got a kid that plays soccer, and I'm just waiting for him to realize that he's not going to keep playing for very much longer. <laughs> he, he just has to lose a few more times so I can get that through his head. But every time we go up for a header, there's always a head from the back, and he's hitting the ball, and I'm like, oh, great, there went a few more more brain cells. But – you know, I, I hear the other parents that sit in there. Well, you know, I, my, my kid really wants to play. You know, they're, they're feeling okay. They should, they should go play. Well, yeah. the current testing now, I mean, we've gone through uh, Colorado signs and this. And um, before I got into functional medicine, I was still in the, the, the sports medicine chiropractic world. And uh, things have changed dramatically in the past 15 years. And, and most schools, including colleges, still use what's called scat testing. And they still use that in the NFL. By the way, people can fake it. And wow. so the baseline isn't good. So they can come in and they're, they're looking for a baseline. What can you do now? And so they'll know not to answer things when they do their baseline very good. So when they do have a concussion, they can get past it. Um, we look for things that little kids can't do most of the time. You know, can we do certain things like this? A little kid may not have the dexterity to do that. So that's, that's the two things we're looking at. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and most high school athletes, well, or, or, or even adults, well, my headache went away, so I should be fine. But uh, there's other issues other than a headache. You know, how's your memory? How's your bowels? How's your immune system? As you said with your, uh, your patient that slipped and fell, most people do get sick afterwards. Why? Concussion affects brain, affects gut. That's where your immune system, for the most part, live. You end up either sick or worse. You end up with a leaky gut and you end up with the autoimmunity. That's what happens. Uh, the good thing is if you go to the right person, we get you on the right nutrition, we get you on the right neurological plan, you can stop these neurodegeneration because you have neuroplasticity. Your brain can remember what's going on. Just like if you haven't lifted any weights or done anything with your muscles, when you go lift them again, you know that you can do stuff. Uh, it doesn't like it. It's called sore. But if you continue to train that, that soreness will go away. The same thing is with the brain. How you, how you train it is what neuroplasticity, and that's how you overcome these certain things. So when we have you do little exercises, whether it's getting up in the morning and doing a couple squats 
or maybe we want you to uh, learn a new language or play a piano or something that we know that you do that helps build the brain or some puzzles. There's a reason for it. It's that part of the brain needs some help. It needs that altered field. It needs that ketones. It needs that uh, that fat that gets in there so that we can stop you from paying the 150 to 200 thousand dollars a year to help it costs to manage your neurodegeneration disease. Yeah. So I heard you just say something that I know people are going to be relieved to hear because you know we have people in their 20s who come in saying, my brain isn't working. I can't remember things. I'm putting, you know, things that should be in the refrigerator in the microwave. I'm forgetting where my keys are. I can't remember names. And these are 20 year olds, right? And no matter how old you are, when you're having this experience, it's scary, right? You really worry because this, you lose your independence. You know, you really lose your, your life. So it's a big deal, and I know people get really scared about it, but what you just were saying is that it is possible to turn it around. Even the scary stuff. There's nothing in the medical world that's turning around Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but um, the research is, and, and, and it's not just from chiropractors or naturopaths. It's, it's in the medical community. If you fix the leaky gut, or fix it by meaning you manage it. Let's be clear there. We manage your leaky gut so you're no longer having any of those things that cause it. You manage the autoimmunity so that you're no longer having things that are driving the immune system and you get the blood sugar mm -hmm. and the fuel to the brain, meaning that your blood pressure, all your blood supply to the brain is working properly. Mm -hmm. These things reverse. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So um, before... I got out of school, we knew that the human population was changing, not necessarily changing as in, you know, we're growing web feet or anything. It was just that we know more and that this autoimmune thing was kind of blowing up in front of us. So the typical chiropractic adjustment wasn't holding, it wasn't working. So I knew we had to go do something a little bit different because I can't, A, can't be, uh, Dr. Carpenter, I just can't be like anybody else. We got to go do something different. Right. That's the first part. The second part is we could see that these things were happening. And so what we were seeing in our clinics or um, with our other colleagues that they were getting terrible results and I was, well, we can't do that. We have to go find something better. Mm -hmm. So the typical chiropractor has to adjust into an inflamed joint or something where the neurology isn't coming there or somebody has blood sugar, or blood pressure that's there. So you get to go back again and again and again, eventually, and it's about 30 to 50 visits. You'll get that one joint to finally go. I get what you're saying but you have a few more joints in that. So we had to learn this thing called autoimmune neurology and, and to stimulate the joint, there are multiple ways to do it. So the research on this called autoimmune neurology is not stimulation because you can get stimulation in joint massage therapy. You can get it in physical therapy. You can get it in your own workout. You can get it in acupuncture. You can get it from a chiropractor, but those pathways are stimulated better and they go to the brain better and they dampen autoimmunity better and they upregulate blood pressure and which we'll say blood pressure is unregular, whether it's high or low. Um, better if you use devices such as our, uh, we use an activator, an, auto, or, um, an, an electric activator, or we use blocking to get the blood flow to the brain better. And here's a kicker, muscle correction. When we do a muscle correction, there's more information that comes from the extremities, whether it's the arms or the legs, that goes up to the brain, which then helps dampen if somebody was too much on the antibody side of the immune system or dampen the side on the cellular destruction side to get them back to even. So the research on this is that we need to treat our autoimmune patients structurally about every four weeks to keep them in their flow. Mm -hmm. not only with that, you know, we still have to do your nutrition because if you don't need nutrition, now you're way over here. Right. Then we got to see you like every day to get you back here. Yeah. So there's everything that we do flows in together, but there is a reason and a rhyme for everything that we do do. It's not just a guess. There is a research study that's telling us we have to do this. And I can promise you in about six months, something's going to change. That's just the nature of this. Yeah. And when we do that, we'll drop what is no longer uh, showing validity and we go the next pathway, yeah. but that's what we have now. So you just said a lot of really important things. And one of them I think is probably surprising to lots of people. Uh, what you were saying is, you know, for the brain to be healthy, you need 
three things, three, three kinds of types of fuel. So we need blood sugar, which we test on every patient. When they first come in, we do blood work. We assess the blood sugar handling. They need oxygen. And I've seen you, every patient, you put this little clip on their finger and you're measuring their oxygen saturation. So we know they're getting enough oxygen to the brain. And if not, I've seen you do some work on muscles just right there in the office that gets the, the brain getting oxygen better and you can measure it after and that's really cool. So we're covered the first two, but the third one you said is activation, neurological activation. And how do you get that? What you said is that traditional chiropractic care may not work as well as we had hoped. And we're both chiropractors. So this is a big thing to say, but a traditional manual adjustment may actually be a little too much. If you take someone who's already struggling, they're already inflamed, and you put a lot of force and a lot of active nerve activation, it can actually be too much. And so people won't recover as expected. And a lot of people who go to chiropractors know like you have to go once a week or you know you go pretty often and you keep doing the same thing. And what you just said, the, the research that you've been reading and the experience you've had and other colleagues have had is once a month. Once a month. And if you can do very gentle work, muscle work, an activator, um, very, very gentle work, but every month that's enough neurological stimulation to keep the brain going. Yeah, and it's more than neuro neurological stimulation because very few chiropractors do anything on the extremities. Right. So we're, it's a it's a win win on on that aspect. Uh, the other part with that neurology is you know we're looking at blood supply. So if you've ever seen me in the office, I take out this little gun and I put a laser on you and I'm checking temperature from here, here, hands, feet. I want to know how your blood supply is going. If you can't have blood supply go to your brain, what kind of outcome can we expect? Can your nutrition get there? Probably not. Can your nervous system have the right energy to fire correctly up there? Or will it be like a, we'll say a short circuit. If I've got a wire that's sitting here and the wire is uh, the, the wire, the, uh, the, the padding or the, the uh, use my wire here. So I've got a wire here. We know there's a, a, a brass metal wire inside of here, but it has a, a protective coating around here. But what if that protective coating is open? Now it has a short to it. So if I don't have proper blood supply or with the neurology, I don't have proper conduction we have a problem and it doesn't get there. But if you can do some muscle therapy, some pelvic blocking, uh, they get up to the brain, they send signals back here for what's called repair. That's how you dampen an immune system. That's why, uh, I mean, people do call into our office and say, I am so sick, I don't wanna come in. And half of me says, I don't want you there either. But we know that if you get that neurological treatment, it overrides the immune system to where it can work better. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff and I know that the people who work with me have heard me talk on and on and on about the importance of dealing with any kind of hidden infection and getting that stressor kind of off their plate. They've heard me talk a lot about identifying foods that they're sensitive to and removing that stressor from their plate, literally, so that their immune system can be calmer and the uh, autoimmunity can calm down and, and not bother them so much. Um, but you just talked about a few other things that people would need to be checked for. You need to check cortisol levels. You gotta check your oxygen levels. You gotta check brain activation and, and your temperature differences from your brain to your feet. Um, there's a, a lot more that can be done these days, more stuff that we know. So. Hopefully you guys at home, like you're making notes, like what you need to get checked. Um, if, if you have an autoimmune condition, aside from those things we just talked about, can you think of anything else, Dr. Trites, that would be important for someone to check on for their own health? Oh, well, uh, when it comes to, let's just check on the leaky gut. There are three um, molecules that sit in, in, inside of the gut, the gut barrier, the brain barrier, the lung barrier. Um, but it also can tell us how long it takes to go on because leaky gut can't be, can't be helped overnight. It could be three to three to 12 months. So we have a blood test that we can run that actually will tell us 
you know, do you have uh, any one of these? One of them is actually three months, one of them is six months, and one of them is 12 months. So we kind of have an idea uh, of what's going on with those, uh, with something called the LPS, onulin, and actinomyosin. It tells us how bad it really is. Um, if you aren't doing any type of exercise, I promise by the end of this summer, I will have a little video for exercise. And by when I talk exercise, I want high intensity. I want one minute. You give me one minute to five minutes of your time. And I think I can get almost everybody on board with that. Why? That creates something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, that enhances neuroplasticity. So if we go back to neuroplasticity, it's what makes your brain recover and work properly. So if we give you these little exercises in the morning, they are extremely important to your recovery, as well as if you have an autoimmune condition, there is no medication that turns off anything to the DNA. But there are supplements that we use in our office that do. So we can dampen the immune system that way. And, when, and for the most part, everybody is already, already doing that. But if you haven't seen us in the office, I'm telling you, there are some things we can do to uh, greatly enhance it, as well as bringing down the cortisol, as well as uh, neurological testing, as well as some other blood tests to find out how long do we really need to be on this leaky gut protocol? Well, we know what the protocol is going to be on time, but then we get to retest when that time comes and say, do we, what do we really have to do with this moving forward? Okay. That helps. So if I'm someone who does have an autoimmune condition and I'm working on it, um, is there any reason I should get my kids or anyone else in my family tested? Well, if we want to talk genes, you're a, uh... If you have an autoimmune disease, uh, that best, at, I mean, at best, your kid has only a 25% chance, but let's be real. 75% uh, of the Americans have an autoimmune condition. They just don't know about it. So uh, when we run, I wouldn't call them blind tests, but when I did some blind tests, we were doing just antibody studies in the lab. That's what we found. And uh, most people don't even know they have anything going on. So if you're at 75% and... Both mom and dad are at 75%. The chances of your one of your children having are 75%. So why not, especially, especially if we go back to those young ladies between the age of 10 and 14, I'm not trying to, to run a 10 and 14-year-old young lady practice, but if we can stop those mechanisms dead on right there, they have so much of a better chance. I mean, um, these are the setups. I mean, we talked about, I think, in a previous uh, – webinar about autism. This is one of the big setups for autism. If you are passing along these genes and all of a sudden this gene is activated, instead of at like 50, it's activated at 10, the pro probability and possibility for your great, your grandchildren and great grandchildren to have these conditions, whether it's they can't have peanuts anymore, uh, they have autism, they have um, any of these things that are, that are occurring that didn't happen 20 years ago. Um, why not do something now? Because I promise you they will Google it and they will be mad at you. That's just the way it is now. I didn't have Google when I was a kid, so I couldn't be mad at my parents. So we already had the talk and said, I wish I'd have known or they wish we'd known. We're on, we're, we're moving on to, to our, to the rest part of our, our life. But, but yeah. the kids have Google now. So beware. Yeah. Well, I know that, you know, your gene status and you're working on optimizing them and managing them. I, I hear all the time things you're doing. Um, so, you know, in the case, so just asked about, you know, kids or family, would you start with gene testing or would you start with something else? Well, I want to make sure that any person that walks in the door, doesn't matter what age they are, are functioning first. Because if you have an infection, so let's say, uh, we'll just start with a kid. If I'm a pediatrician and you bring a kid into my office and say, I would, I would like to have my genes tested on this kid. We have muscular dystrophy in the family. Okay. Um, I noticed that your kid is holding their throat right now. So let's do a strep test. And I have a strep test positive. Should we run your gene test right then? Or should we make sure that that is taken care of? So yeah, care we go through that part first, yeah. but then we go run the genes once we get everything set, because if you've got something that's going to turn off the genes anyway, and that's not being addressed, what's the point? Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So my, my last kind of question for you tonight, I want to kind of end on a, a really interesting note is we know if your antibody levels are above the normal range on the labs, we know you have an autoimmune condition and the levels can be 
moderately high, they can be really high. In your experience, can people get their antibody levels back to the normal range? Yeah, all the time. Cool. And for those who have Epstein-Barr, all the time. Cool. So how long does it typically take? What do you see? Well, if everybody's on board to start with, probably about three months, but there's a learning curve. I mean, uh, you walk out of there and go, okay, now I got this this gluten-free thing, and then maybe I should stay away from dairy, and wait a minute, I got a birthday tomorrow. And uh, well, maybe I'll start it next week. That, that's life, that's life. So the average is probably six months. Um, but we have some markers that tell us six months may not be enough time, or you've had this for 30 years and you're asking us to do this in a short amount of time. Let's be real. Let's look at what you have. And, you know, if, if we don't have a major improvement in a year, I'll be shocked. All right. That's hopeful because this is an area that gets really scary, not just the brain stuff, but just autoimmunity in general and kind of the devastation it can have on our bodies and our lives. And generally we hear there's not much hope. You just live with it. And so that's a really hopeful thing to hear as we wrap up all of this stuff. So um, Dr. Trites, thank you for your time and, you and all the good information. And for everybody who's out there listening or who may watch this recording later, really glad to have you. I hope that this helped. I hope that you learned something. I'm betting that you learned something new. And if there's anything we can do at New Leaf, to help, please don't hesitate. Call us. We would love to help you out. All right. Everybody have a good evening. Bye.